Right, okay, so um, we're recording now. So hi everyone, thanks, for, thanks so much for coming tonight and it's great to see everyone. Um, I know it's um, August is always a diff funny time for sort of, sort of meetings and things and stuff where um, but people, a lot of people are away at the minute and I've, I've had a few apologies from people who wanted to come to this meeting who couldn't come but we are on YouTube so um, this, uh, this recording will be available for everyone afterwards and we'll, set, we'll send it round. Um, so yeah, so if you haven't introduced yourself in the chat, feel free to do that um, and um, that'd be really cool. So um, yeah, so I think we'll probably make a start and we'll get Matt to start his presentation um, talking um, about this, this, um, this topic and it's, um, it's a really great, great time to be talking about this kind of thing because uh, yeah, there's lots of, lots of things to look forward to I think. Um, um, over the between now and the rest of the year to kind of start um, to start looking at kind of um, trying to get, get back into a into a sense of kind of doing th things again in terms of trying to clean up our, our local areas and look after our local spaces so um, we're looking forward to yeah lots of uh, lots of opportunities around that and Matt will be talking more about that so um, I'll hand over to Matt now and yeah take it away Matt. Great, so thank you, Greg. Uh, so yeah, I'd also like to say it's nice to see everyone's faces, uh, some new faces that I've never seen before. And um, there's a few people that I recognise the names and um, a few of our volunteers are in here as well. So it's good that uh, we've got a, a variety of people joining us tonight. Um, so yeah, I'll just uh, introduce myself. So I'm Matt. I'm the catchment officer for the Trust, uh, the Don Catchment Rivers Trust. Um, if you don't know anything about us, we're a, a small charity, there's about seven of us, um, primarily based in Doncaster, but we, um, our current project is in Chesterfield. Um, so we spent maybe the last three years uh, on another project called Living Heritage of the River Don, which concentrated on getting um, salmon um, up to Sheffield by building fish passes along weirs. And uh, our new project is called Hidden Heritage Secret Streams. And it's a lottery heritage fund uh, funded project. And we're about halfway through the project at the moment. Uh, so I'll just um, go over what I'm gonna speak about tonight. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a sort of small history of the uh, rather catchment, just uh, where it's come from and where it is today. and. Um, where we're hoping it's going to be in the future. Um, just a, a breakdown of the uh, Hidden Heritage project up to now, uh, what it's been like through lockdown, because uh, we've been working right through lockdown, um, none of us run furlough, and uh, about the future of the project. Um, Greg's asked me to include a few interesting finds uh, from river cleanups. Uh, so maybe you'll find them as interesting as we do, maybe not, who knows, we'll soon find out. Uh, and then also how about you can get involved with, um, with the trust in the future with all of our activities that we're hoping to continue with. Uh, so I'll start with um, the, the word rather and sort of like the etymology of the word rather. And so it's, um, it's an early Britonic word, which the raw, um, is thought to have come from meaning great or red or brown and um, the th meaning uh, water and together it makes rubber and I was trying to think of like why they might have thought it was red and there is a few streams uh, in the rather catchment that are still quite red from um, ochre and which is a naturally occurring substance and I thought maybe um, they might have got this this sort of red brown uh, colour from that. So yeah, so it still is a bit red brown in places. Um, so sort of like pre-industry um, times, uh, we've got this quite a great quote from Samuel uh, Laman uh, Blanchard, who was an author and journalist who traveled to uh, the Rother in um, around 1836. And he said the rother was a, a beauteous stream with anglers enjoying catching chub, roach and perch from its waters. And it's well known that the rother um, was previous, previously uh, a principal source of uh, salmon stocks for the Don. And so you can just imagine how um, sort of 
pristine and um, uh, you know great for wildlife these uh, these waters uh, were uh, but then um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware the industry uh, industrial revolution happened and so during this time a lot of um, a lot of uh, lead was mined from the White Peaks. Um, and because of the rich coal and iron uh, seams in the peaks, um, lots of towns and villages started popping up around the, uh, around the rivers. Um, the rivers basically became an open sewer because um, this, the sewage had to go somewhere. And so it often got washed into the river. Um, the rivers were heavily modified uh, to accommodate for um, wanting to reclaim land uh, for farming and um, it was also a way to help with flooding um, to sort of move water quicker um, and also weirs were built so if you're not sure what a weir is uh, this is a picture of a weir uh, on our left and um, so these were used to sort of harness the power of the river and uh, a mill race or like a little goit, um, just a small stream would come off the top of these um, weirs and um, be pushed over a water wheel and that in turn would um, power the uh, mills. And so this one is uh, um, Slitting Mills and so at Slitting Mill Farm just um, near Stavely. Uh, they specialised in um, cutting iron bars into strips, which would in turn produce nails. So that's just sort of like an example of the industry you might have found once um, on the river. And so, um, as you imagine from that uh, that quote that we saw earlier, that you know that it was still quite a, a relatively clean river up till the uh, nineteenth and uh, um, early. 18th century but with uh, another blow to wildlife um, saw so the Avenue Coke Works and Stavely Chemical Works just to name two um, along the river um, the, uh, were built and um, there was less regulation in that time uh, so a lot of um, a lot of uh, waste from this from these industries were either left on site or would uh, eventually find the way into the river, sort of polluting the, the waters. Um, more jobs uh, became, with, with more uh, jobs came um, more people living in the cities and the towns. And so um, again, the sewage treatment works were just weren't built to be able to cope with this many people, um, meaning a lot of it still uh, went into the, the river untreated. And um, the Don catchment was known as one of the most polluted catchments in Europe, with the Rother actually being the most polluted uh, river in the catchment. So um, whether you like it or not, it was, it was quite a title to have. Um, but um, we've all was not lost. Uh, so we've seen um, in a lot of the upper uh, uh, areas of the catchment, so in the uh, tributaries of the Rother, um, was a refuge for, um, for wildlife such as white clawed crayfish, our native crayfish, and you get a lot of brown trout and bullhead fish. So they were still able to live in the upper reaches of the catchment that weren't really affected by the industrial waste as much as the main uh, channel was of the Rother. Um, in the 80s, water quality improved, so um, a lot of the treatment works were modernised. We saw a lot of uh, coking plant closures, um, which wasn't great for jobs, but um, saw um, the environment, the river environment, uh, vastly improve. And also, um, the Environment Agency had new powers of enforcement, which uh, allowed them to crack down on people and industry that was still persisting to pollute in in the uh, in the environment and so we saw a return of um fish so this is a grayling fish in the front it's got this sort of sail like uh dorsal fin a uh, very beautiful fish and then just above that is a brown trout 
So these are just an example of two of the fish that you will find uh, in the dom catchment, uh, and especially in the rother. And as mentioned before, we saw um, salmon disappear from our um, from our waters. I forgot to mention actually that the reason why uh, we we found a lot of the uh, salmon uh, to disappear was that the weirs became an obstacle to the salmon run and they couldn't actually get up physically up the river so it was a block um, but as um, more and more weirs were uh, improved so either fish passes were put on or um, they were removed completely we've seen more um, salmon being caught and this one was caught in the rother uh, within the last year so we um, had this report come through Facebook and uh, so it's very exciting to see um, fish like this return. And it just goes to show how much the, uh, it's changed the water quality uh, since then. And I also just wanted to show you this video. I've just checked before I started and it's not actually playing anymore. So I'm just gonna stop sharing and then reshare my other screen. And so this is uh, some footage of otters that we got on our camera traps. And so this is a family of three, a mother and two cubs. And so you'll see the mum just about to scent there so that she's doing um, this thing called an anal jelly, which is a scent marker. And so, yeah, we uh, found this on one of our camera traps and um, it just, we were absolutely amazed to see uh, otters surviving there and it just goes to show how like um, how plentiful our rivers are and how um, how much wildlife uh, they're able to support including these top predators like otters which will need a lot of fish to uh, to survive uh, let's get back into my presentation Can you see my screen as that? Oh, wait. There we go. So yeah, as I said, um, there's still more work to be done and that's where our projects come in. So from this um, picture, you can see all these green dots are weirs where fish, uh, migrating fish such as um, trout and salmon are able to pass. But then they'd come to Sletting Mill Farm and be faced with this big weir. And so um, this came to our attention and um, it seemed like a relatively easy uh, weir to remove. Um, I maybe wouldn't say that to my project manager who's been involved with removing it. Um, but it was because uh, it's um, quite a rural weir, um, it was quite easy to start the process of removing it. And so that's what we've been doing at the moment. And um, so we've been uh, making this the focus of the Hidden Heritage Secret Streams project. But we've also got um, another aspect to it, which is the, um, the community engagement side. So we've been, um, we've been, so we're, uh, <laughs> So the lottery like to have a lot of engagement within their projects. They don't just like capital works where the contractors come in and leave. They want to engage the local community in what is actually going on the river. And so we have this um, strand to our project called uh, Citizen Science. And so Citizen Science is just a way of um, getting people that are within the community who have loads of ex uh, expertise and skills to come and help us out and um, sort of do science, practical science, and um, to test uh, whether removing this weir is beneficial for wildlife. So what we've been doing is uh, doing macro invertebrate river sampling and analysis. And that's just a sort of fancy way of saying We've been looking at the insects that live in the river um, and often they live in the sand and in the stones and in the silt of the river and looking at what's living there. And so you can get quite a good picture of what water quality is like based upon what animals are living there. So if you, um, 
if you get a lot of things like freshwater shrimp or um, hog lice, um, it's sort of uh, their pollutant uh, tolerant species. So it sort of shows that it will support life, but um, you know, there may be some pollutants in there. But if you're finding things like caddis fly and mayfly, um, it shows that, um, which are quite pollutant sensitive uh, animals, um, it shows that there are, it's actually quite um, a clean environment for them to live in. Um, so we've this a few of our um, uh, volunteers here. So we get um, a, a net and we sort of kick the bottom of the river, collect it into um, this net, and sort of have a, a nosy round and see what we can find in there. And so we we sort them um, into their respective species and family groups. And uh, so, yeah, you can see here we found lots of mayflies, lots of freshwater shrimp. You get lots of uh, small bivalves, which you might not have expected to see as uh, so, like little mussels. And so you're like, yeah, you're finding quite a broad range of um, animals, which shows that it is a healthy river system. But we wanted to show that um, the comparison before and after the weir removal to see if anything did change. And so here's some of our volunteers that we've trained up to um, identify some of the invertebrates, which can be a bit tricky at times because they're so small. So we have to get our magnifying glasses out and our um, microscopes. And so yeah, we do a lot of training. Um, so here we have, uh, we did um, a mammal uh, ID course. Um, specifically around river mammals. So this is uh, a skin of a, an otter actually. And um, off the back of this, we uh, did some water shrew surveying because uh, I'd never even heard of a water shrew before doing that training. And it sort of made us enthusiastic about trying to see if we could find any. So um, these are just baited tubes. So the water shrew goes into there, does a little poo and then um, you can actually identify uh, whether a water shrew has been there just by uh, looking at its poo under a microscope. And as you saw from that footage, we've been doing camera trapping. So just seeing what wildlife is on there. Um, we've also been doing bio blitzes. Um, so this is where you uh, host an event where you can invite anyone along to. Uh, so family, experts, everyone gets along. Uh, into it and um, sort of try and count as many species of plants and animals as possible. And so that's what a bio blitz is. Um, so uh, another big strand of the capital works has been our natural flood management. So this is Debbie who's joining us tonight. And so she's been working with, uh, she's been employed to work with public and private landowners to sort of um, try and identify uh, key areas within Chesterfield that we can do natural flood management on to help alleviate flooding in Chesterfield. And so we've been looking at areas that might help uh, capture and slow down rainfall, um, which um, helps reduce flood risk. And it's all about reducing the peak flow um, during high uh, water events. Uh, I don't want to say flatten the curve because, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of that recently, but it's a similar idea of where you're trying to stop the peak flow of the, um, when we do have lots of rain uh, and uh, try and, um, you know, just help uh, reduce flooding a little bit in Chesterfield. And so we can do this by planting trees, which uh, in turn improves the soils makes them more water absorbent. It creates lots of air pockets, which the, the water will run into and act like a sponge. Um, we, we've been doing uh, leaky dams. So this is a picture of um, a site in the Moss Valley where we've been working with a private woodland owner there. And she's very enthusiastic uh, about improving um, the woodland. And part of that is improving it for um, water management. And so this is us carrying uh, a log pre-lockdown. This has actually taken a few weeks just before lockdown. And so, um, yeah, this is where you just sort of put um, a, almost like a, a barrier 
in the river uh, that activates during uh, peak times. Um, this is sort of a simplified version of one. And um, that'll sort of create a little flood storage area, like a temporary flood storage area. And uh, will slowly release the water back into the river instead of having the water just run down all at once, ending up in our towns and cities and flooding them. Uh, and so, yeah, this is just some of our overland drainage. And so all these sort of things have multiple benefits. It's not just about um, helping flooding. It enhances and creates wildlife habitats. So um, creating new little pockets of habitat. Um, improves river quality. So um, you get a lot of sediment coming off uh, farmers' fields um, and from the, uh, from the moors and you get little particles of soil and uh, these sort of measures help stop those getting into our rivers and um, basically silting them up which is why a lot of places would dredge because all these little particles form um, big bigger bigger particles and then reduces the capacity of the river to hold water uh, and it has an added uh, benefit of capturing carbon as well so that's a little bit what we've been doing uh, before lockdown. So uh, yeah, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, lockdown happened. And um, so we wanted to try and keep people engaged in the river, keep our um, volunteers engaged. And uh, one of the ideas that we had was to create a weekly newsletter, which we previously didn't do. And so we called it From Home to the River. So we um, compiled articles about what people can do to help the river whilst they're in lockdown at home. Um, we did YouTube videos. So we uh, sort of quickly learned how to present. We weren't like natural presenters. Well, speaking for myself, uh, not a natural presenter. And so we had to like, sort of like throw ourselves in the deep end and um, you know, become uh, the Chris Packhams of uh, the, for the Don Catchment Rivers Trust. And so he's Sally, um, showing people how to set up a wildlife camera in the garden. It's well worth a watch. Uh, so yeah, you can visit our YouTube channel and uh, see all these videos that we've been creating. Um, there's also the River Guardians packs, which we usually would hand out to schools, but we've not been able to do that because um, uh, schools haven't been open. Been open. And so we've been sending these out um, in food, uh, food packages to um, families in need, just as a way of trying to engage people that might not, not necessarily have the internet. And so giving them a few activities to keep them entertained and still engaged in the river. Um, we've been doing a lot of online training recently, so some of you might have been on it. So we've been doing stuff around bumblebees, freshwater fish, and foraging and they they've been absolutely great and um really successful getting lots of people signed up to them and um you can actually view those on youtube as well um so have a look out for those if you miss them um our volunteers love litter picking and uh yeah we uh, just wanted to help them continue litter picking so when restrictions had uh, uh released a bit, little bit, um, we were able to go out and give out our volunteers packs to go out by themselves and um, keep safe at the same time. And so we get a little update from them every so often saying, I've got so many bags from, uh, from this river in Chesterfield. So uh, yeah, we just, we just wanted to keep them, uh, you know, doing what they love best. Um, recently, we've been hunt and getting people signed up to do well dressing kits. So if you're not uh, aware of well dressing, it's a, a festival that happens in Chesterfield every year and it's to celebrate water and um, everything that gives us. So it just seemed like a, a natural home for the Rivers Trust. And so um, we're sending out uh, well dressing kits to anyone that's interested. So you can actually still sign up if you're interested in creating one of these. So we're just going to do a small um, sort of like 20 centimeter by 30 centimeter frame and we, we give you all the everything that you need to create it and then you just um, get leaves and um, petals and you can create this um, image that we're going to display at Tapton Lock Activity Centre 
So if you're interested in getting uh, one of those, uh, get in touch with us. I'll give the um, all the information of how to get in touch with us at the end. But yeah, um, those are still available for people. And then we uh, were quite a social bunch. And so we, uh, we found quite quickly that we missed our volunteers and we wanted to you know, keep in touch with them and um, how better to stay in touch than Zoom. Uh, so it, wasn't, it didn't quite replace volunteer days, but um, we were able to have a natter about all the wildlife that we'd, uh, that we'd seen, um, which fill in each other about what's been going on with our lives. And then uh, we usually did a, a little wildlife quiz each week. Uh, so that's been it's, been, it's just been really great keeping that going, keeping that contact and, um, you know, it's, it's helped me as well, uh, just like speaking to uh, a variety of people. So we've really enjoyed that. But it's no replacement for what we usually do. And um, that's our river cleanup days. And uh, that's why um, Greg uh, has been, we've, we've worked in the past, we've, uh, this is actually from our plastic free Chesterfield volunteer day. So these, a lot of these were brand new volunteers to us. So engaged through Plastic Free Chesterfield. And um, so this is down at Spittle Trail in Chesterfield, if you weren't sure where that is. Um, and yeah, I'll just give you a little flavor of what we usually get up to. So people usually love this photo of uh, one of our volunteers with a, a shopping trolley just outside Ravenside Retail Park. Um, and yeah, you, you can usually find us in the pair of waders, sort of uh, knee deep and uh, digging stuff basically that just shouldn't be out in there out. And um, so yeah, we like to get uh, we like we like to get mucky and stuck in. Uh, but there's you know there's lots of um, opportunities for people from in different abilities. So you can just stick to the footpaths if you want. Um, so yeah, there's there's. It's something for everyone, basically, and it's um, it's really good for socialising. So we usually get together for a cup of tea, and uh, we usually a, a fair few biscuits as well. Um, so yeah, it's we miss our volunteers, we miss our um, tea breaks, and we're hoping to get back there sometime again in the future, in whatever form that may be. Uh, and so, yeah, that leads me on quite nicely to our interesting finds, and uh, which Greg has asked me to uh, just sort of give a, an overview of. And initially, I was like, oh, well, you know, we just find a lot of plastic bottles. But uh, once I actually start, started thinking about it, we do find stuff you just wouldn't expect to see there, and uh, which usually have a bit of a story to tell. So um, this is one of our volunteers, Anthony Meadows, and he started life off as a, a litter picker like most of us do. do. Uh, but he quickly found that there was other things than litter to be found. And so he quickly became our brick expert. So Anthony uh, would find interesting bricks like this. I can't, oh, what did he, oh, I can't remember what it was, exactly what it is, but it's some, some special brick, which Anthony was very excited about. Um, but we find all sorts of stuff like this tan card um, and these weights, which we found quite recently. And he, uh, if Anthony likes to go on back and do a bit of research and um, just let us know what, what he found out. And so these were actually about 80 years old and um, they, we just found them on the riverbank. So. You just never know what you're going to find. It's a bit like a, um, a treasure hunt sometimes. And then this, uh, this sort of frame that you can see Anthony with on the left, he's got that in his garden now. So I always say that you can, you can take home whatever you find, find us keepers. Um, this was a bit of an interesting find. So we were a bit um, confused about what this was at first, but uh, someone did a bit of research and found out it was an old fire extinguisher, produced somewhere between the 1900s and 1960s, uh, and it was just in the river. And so, yeah, this is what it looked like before it was rusted. Um, so, you know, we just find all sorts. Uh, I'm, as I'm sure 
uh, some of you are aware, um, Chesterfield is, was really important for pottery due to the clear deposits um, found throughout the region. Um, Pearson's Pottery was um, one of the biggest uh, manufacturers of stoneworks in the country. Um, and the canal was integral to uh, the export of uh, pottery and the river was integral to the canal. And uh, it feels like it's come full circle finding a lot of stuff uh, produced from the pottery in, in the river. It sort of like fuels its, its own manufacturer almost. And so we found this clear pipe, which was really fun to find. Um, but also just, just all sorts of sort of interesting histories around um, the manufacturers of these, um, these, these bottles, basically, these clear bottles. And so we like to see where they've come from. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're all a bit of a history geek of the, of the trust. Um, here's another example, um, a wine made from a company in Louth in the mid uh, 1800s. Um, so yeah, we just did a bit of research and found that this is what it might have looked like at one point. And so we've, we're finding all this stuff. Um, it's kind of making up the bed of the river. Um, and it's, you know, it's fairly innocuous stuff. It doesn't really harm the river. In fact, it's like, it's, it's good if anything, because um, insects will sort of attach themselves to it. Moss will grow on it. So it's, it's not all um, bad to find this sort of stuff in the river. Um, a few interesting ecological finds. So we find quite often these uh, swan and or duck mussel shells. It's really difficult to like discern between them both. You have to look at some kind of lateral joint on, uh, on the uh, edge of them uh, to find out whether a swan or a duck mussel. But um, yeah, uh, you just, I'm, I'm always surprised by stuff that you find in the river. And this was, for me, it was like, I just didn't know uh, you'd find things like this there. And um, so these are freshwater mussels, uh, which are great food for things like otters. And you often find them cracked from where birds have uh, broken into them or otters will have opened them up to eat. You also find a lot of these things. You might have heard of them, um, the American signal crayfish. So they're an invasive species from introduced from America initially for food. They've escaped and got into our river systems and they can cause a lot of problems uh, for our native uh, crayfish, which is the white clawed crayfish, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and Chesterfield actually is um, an arc site for the white clawed crayfish. And um, the invasive signal crayfish carries this um, crayfish plague that um, if it com comes into contact with the native white clod, it can actually cause them to die. Um, it's, a, it's a disease. And so we have to be really careful because we know that the native white claws are in the area. And so after a volunteer day, we often um, wash down our equipment and our waders with a sort of antiviral um, a spray just to stop the spread. And so, yeah, it's, and even though it is an invasive and it shouldn't be here and it causes so much like harm to the environment, I get really excited to see these things. Um, they, they just look at them they're like a, a, a lobster. Uh, and who would have thought we'd have a lobster in the, uh, in the river? So, you know, these sometimes crop on, um, up on volunteer days too. Um, like Chris Packham, we love scat. We love uh, finding poos. And uh, so, yeah, we found this top one uh, quite recently, and we suspect it might be an otter poo, uh, which uh, if you smell, it smells like, um, like a jasmine tea. It has like a sort of musty smell, which it does. And uh, it had lots of um, scales from what I believe to be a, a crayfish. So, you know, you've got these otters that are um, competing with uh, the crayfish. And so it's really important that we have these um, the otters to have a balanced, um, healthy ecosystem, keeping everything in check and in balance. So yeah, we love, we love a good poo. 
Um, and something else we find a lot of uh, is litter. And so, yeah, this is, this is a picture from one of our first volunteer days um, at Queen's Park uh, on the River Hipper. And uh, yeah, uh, this is just an example of the type of litter. You get a lot of cones, uh, a lot of, you know, just basically everyday plastics find them uh, find themselves in the river, wh whether intentional or not. Um, and so Greg sort of asked me to talk about the, um, the damage that uh, riv um, plastic is doing to the rivers. And as well as it's not only unsightly, um, it is going out to the sea. And I got this fact from the Surface Against Sewage website saying that, um, you know, 100,000 marine animals and turtles and 1 million seabirds are killed by marine plas plastic annually. And so, yeah, this is all stuff that just shouldn't be there. And um, it just goes to show like what an impact um, plastic is having. And river systems are just a conduit for plastic. So you might think, oh, we're in, you know, we're totally landlocked in Chessfield, um, but we're more connected to the sea than you might think. And so anything that ends up in our rivers might end up in our seas. And I'm not going to pretend I'm a scientist or like I know a lot about um, plastic and its effects. But um, Greg actually uh, got me onto this um, this lecture by uh, a plastic scientist at the Natural History Museum, and this is Alex. And so she has been doing um, studies on the Thames and uh, finding what plastics, uh, like the abundance of plastics, like what type of plastic is uh, being found, and also been researching what kind of effect it has on um, the the river wildlife that's there so i can really recommend watching that um that a lecture to get a really detailed breakdown of um straight from this horse's mouth of a scientist <laughs> but um i sort of did a bit of research and uh, got this article from the natural history museum as well um so alex found that um you know 20 uh, Twenty-eight percent of the fish living in the Thames estuary found to have eaten microplastics, and um, and although uh, these uh, can sort of um, accumulate in high densities, there just isn't quite the research yet to say what effect it's having on mar um, river animals, and a lot of the research has been focused on the oceans. Um, so it's sort of, you know, it's, it can be, it can feel like it's very evident to know uh, what damage it's having, but uh, we just, we just need more research basically to find out what effect it is having. Um, but what she has found uh, in particular was the contribution of um, clothing fibers. So um, yeah, plastics that make our clothes um, in the washing machines uh, get, um, Put out into the drainage system that can find its way into the river and so a major contribution of the plastics that she was finding uh, was from stuff like clothes and uh, fishing equipment um, and you know, you know there's things that we can do to stop that happening um, by putting filters on our um, on our washing machines to stop the micro uh, fibers uh, getting in there uh, or by wearing natural uh, materials. Um, but that isn't to say that, um, you know, we, we're all fully aware of the damage that uh, it has on the ocean. Um, so it's really important that we do try and reduce uh, or just stop altogether the amount of plastics that are getting into our rivers. And that's sort of like is the main... Um, sort of drive with our um, cleanups because, you know, no one likes to see a, a plastic bottle in the river, but it will find its way out to sea eventually. And so I just get like, I just get a really good feeling whenever I, I pick up a, a plastic bottle or a pick, crisp packet out of the river and knowing that um, if I hadn't picked this up, it almost certainly 
would have ended up in the sea where it's almost impossible to retrieve and will be in, in the environment for a very long time. So, uh, you know, things like that keep keep me going <laughs> when I'm, uh, you know, when it's raining and I'm cold and I'm wet and uh, I'm in I'm in the river in my waders. Uh, that keeps that sort of that keeps me going. So yeah, wet wipes. Um, if you're not aware, so we have a, a combined sewage system um, in the UK. So that means that anything that you put down the toilet should be going to the um, the sewage treatment works. But in times of high flow, these back up. The sewage treatment works can't uh, handle that amount of um, water going through it and it, uh, it overflows into the river. And so these are called combined sewage overflows or you might heard CSOs for short. And this is just a very common site that we'll see. And so this is a picture of, um, it's, this isn't actually on, on the, uh, this has just com uh, come from Google, but this is a very uh, common site that we see. So lots of wet wipes that people have flushed down the toilet that are supposedly flushable. Well, yeah, they're not. And, um, and uh, yeah, so this is what's happening. And Alex actually says how they're finding um, almost like reefs of wet wipes in the Thames where they're just digging and digging and they're finding huge um, just banks of, of wet wipes, which is quite distressing to hear. And this just is an, is an example of the effect of plastic uh, on wildlife firsthand. So this is actually is a picture that I've taken. And so this picture on the left is of a moor hen's nest uh, just near Ravenside Retail Park. And you can see that it's got some eggs in it. And then there's wet wipes sort of uh, integrated into the, into, the, um, into the nest, which it just doesn't look great, does it? Uh, and then the picture on the right uh, is a few months later, um, a, a dead moor hen. And who's to say um, how this bird might have died? I would have had to have scooped it up and taken it uh, to a laboratory or a vet um, to sort of investigate why it might have died. But it just feels very poignant that I found this dead moor hen almost in the exact same spot as this um, this nest full of uh, littered uh, littered with litter. Um, so yeah, he used to say how it died, but it just felt very poignant. And um, yeah, so yeah, it just it was like a very uh, strong um, yeah sort of negative feeling that I got towards plastic. And yeah, this is just uh, something else that I found on. Um, uh, on on the internet, uh, so this is on the Thames. It was in uh, circulating on uh, the internet uh, on news websites a little while ago, and yeah, this one's just totally integrating um, stuff that it's finding into its nest. Uh, so yeah, it's just it just doesn't look great. So yeah, so that's what we're sort of trying to stop, uh, and this is a little infographic of. Um, everything that we've been up to in the first year of our project. And I've sort of put a little red circle around this one because I thought you might be more interested in this one. Uh, so this is where we've cleaned up four miles of river, um, taken 761 bags of litter. Yeah, we count out every one. Uh, and 24 trolleys and uh, 24 tyres, strangely enough, same number. Um, and then I could have filled the whole presentation with pictures of litter that we found, but it would have been very boring. And uh, so this is just like an example of, this is maybe like a top estimate of what we find on a volunteer day. This is like a, a particularly bad area. So this was just on, uh, this is called the Rother Wreck or uh, Rother Washlands, um, just in central Chesterfield, just upstream of Chesterfield on the Rother. Um, and yeah, this is just an example of the sort of stuff that we, the, the amount of stuff that we get. And then, yeah, this is just a picture of our, uh, one of our volunteers, you know, uh, getting stuck in and uh, it can be hard work, but you know, it's good for, 
good for the mind and good for the soul and good for the body as well to keep fit. Uh, I just wanted to like sort of go over a few like little statements that our volunteers have uh, said in the past, just to uh, sort of give an idea, a little bit of a flavour of what they get from volunteering with us. So Susie uh, was a citizen science and a catchment uh, volunteer. Um, so she uh, was, um, you know, trying to find work in the conservation um, sector, and she just found it really. Uh, oh, it provided with loads of opportunities to learn, such as the training and uh, the sort of practical side of things as well that she wouldn't have had otherwise. So it's really great for people wanting to get in, like change careers. Um, and yeah, well, it was quite nice of her to say that she's met some amazing people and made some great friends. And I just hope that um, goes to show what you can sort of get from volunteering with us. Um, it's not just turn up and uh, see how many um bags of litter you can get um yeah so sort of nice people at the same time uh so yeah dan uh is full of great quotes so um he he likes to say that you can't be more connected to the river than wading in it and um you know he finds it fun and relaxing and he finds it really great to socialize um, with people that he wouldn't necessarily have met um and then sarah um she doesn't come out all the time because she has a full-time job, but we do, or we have done um, Saturday volunteer days in the past, which she comes along to. So yeah, it just goes to show it's for everybody with the, um, and it's like not a commitment at all. It's sort of, uh, sort of dip in and dip out. You're not expected to come to everyone, uh, turn up if you, if you want to. We're very relaxed. Um, so yeah, that's just sort of a, an idea of what you can expect from a volunteer day. And so yeah, so um, just what can you expect? It's gonna be dark in here now, maybe I'll turn the light on. Um, what you can expect from us from the future. So um, COVID-19 has changed the project quite a lot. We are starting to do a few uh, volunteer days again at a reduced capacity. So. This is um, two of our volunteer days that helped out with that. And um, so, you know, keep an eye out for um, events and um, uh, sort of public events that we we're going to be putting out. Um, you can uh, follow, I'm going to put it all at the end about uh, where you can find us on Twitter and Facebook and all that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, our priority is to keep our uh, volunteers safe. So we're uh, you know, we're taking a very steady approach to getting back to volunteering uh, within the government guidelines. And um, so, yeah, just, you know, stay in touch to see how things progress. And just a final word to say, yeah, come and uh, join us and serve a seal. And uh, if this looks inviting to you, uh, yeah, we'd love to see you. And um, so, yeah, keep in touch via Facebook. Uh, Twitter, we're on Instagram, and um, you can also sign up to our newsletter. Uh, we're not running it as um, often as we were during lockdown, but we still are running uh, a monthly newsletter. And so these are just a few of the ways that you can keep in touch with us. And uh, yeah, that's it basically. So, um, so if you've got any questions about uh, what I've talked about, about um, the trust, about um, about projects that we're involved with, uh, anything about, if you've got any burning questions about natural flood management, Debbie's here, great person to ask about that. Uh, so yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Greg for asking me to do it. Fantastic, amazing. Thank you so much. If you want to stop yeah, sharing the screen. Stop sharing now. Yeah. There we go. Fantastic. Brilliant. Oh well, thanks. Thanks so much for that. It was really, really, really good, and lots, lots of, lots to cover in there, and so much that you do was just so good <laughs> to see. So yeah, thank you so much for doing that. And it's um, really it's interesting to see some of the some of the stuff you find and everything around that. Um, so so um, does anyone does anyone have any questions? Um, uh, hi, Greg. It's Angela Thorogood. We've 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 talked. A little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd really like to get involved with this project. So, 
Um, are you able to email me some details or um, to me? Yeah, what we'll um, do is um, um, we've got all the people who registered for the this talk, so we'll send um, when we'll send we'll send an email out to everyone um, afterwards with um, okay. all the links for how for how Brilliant. you can, can stay okay. to get involved. Excellent, thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, no, that's great. No worries. Does anyone else have any other questions for Matt? Um, we had we did have a couple of questions before, um, but I just. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I think it's really, I think it's so good what you what you do. I think, like, in terms of like all the river river, river cleans, especially. Um, but um, I just wonder, sort of, like, whether there's, I mean, you know, it's it's, it's really interesting um, looking at, like, I I found what particularly the the study in the Thames really interesting about the microplastics. Yeah. And I just wondered whether that was something that. Um, I wondered whether that was something that was sort of on the radar in terms of sort of like kind of carrying out some maybe some studies in terms of kind of collecting some river samples and maybe looking at kind of the issues of microplastics in 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 around Chesterfield's rivers. Yeah, I think um, it's something that we'd like to know, and it'd be like uh, another just another reason to keep on doing what we're doing, um, and. I think, uh, yeah, working, it's, it's working with the universities, basically, they've got the, you know, the academic know-how and um, the resources to be able to do those sort of studies. And so we'd love it if, um, you know, if a, if a student came along to us interested in um, investigating plastics in, like, locally in, in the Don catchment. Uh, so, yeah. Um, We'd, we'd be all ears basically <laughs> so yeah totally. but we, um, i think i, I think it would that. be really good i don't know yeah. if um anyone uh yeah i don't know i don't know if that's it's something i think worth approaching with the university of derby or sheffield university and seeing if there's if there's something that anyone could do around that but i think it would be genuinely genuinely interesting to see um looking at kind of carrying out some sort of studies around microplastics around our uh, waterways so definitely i think that would be really interesting totally. um yeah, so I think I think yeah, definitely worth worth exploring. Um, does anyone have? Um, I know there was a question that came in from Kat earlier earlier on about national natural flood flood management. Um, yeah, sorry, I thought I'd I'd wait and just kind of answer that in person uh, rather than try and do it <clears throat> on the chat. If that's all right, um, let me just find exactly what the question was. So the question was, how many NFM schemes have already started on the rather? How many are being planned? and when does the lottery funding end so um i've been in post now just over a year and the initial kind of two-year project was just looking to see what opportunities there were for nfm and if there was um you know kind of the, the interest and the opportunity and uh, we found that there was lots of opportunity so we're now finally at a stage where we're um, starting to get some of those in on the ground so um, the pictures matt was showing of getting the logs in place um, just before lockdown. Um, unfortunately, that was the end to <laughs> getting stuff in on the ground um, as a result of, of the lockdown. But we've got a couple of uh, schemes kind of ready and rearing to go as soon as we can. Um, so those are kind of fairly small scale schemes with um, landowners <laughs> in, in private woodlands um, in the Moss Valley. And we're actually going out on site tomorrow uh, to work with some new uh, farmers that we've uh, recently been contacted by um, and so we've got some some schemes that are getting going with those over the next uh, well starting in the next week and going on for the next um, year or so and um, so that's pretty exciting and then we're also working with the councils trying to look at some larger scale schemes as well because the idea with natural flood management is that it's kind of the cumulative um, you know, of all those individual projects coming together that add up and, and have a, a benefit um, to try and help reduce flooding. So, so there's a few things that we're now, it's kind of kicking off, things really starting to get going, but um, the project's going to be running, well, that NFM side of the project, we've just had another three-year extension, so we're hoping to be able to do a lot more over the next few years. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you so much. And um, 
because I know, in, especially in terms of sort of like when you're looking at natural flood management, in terms of like when you look at kind of planting trees, it's kind of a win-win, isn't it? Really, because um, you know, because obviously we we need to be planting a lot more trees to kind of soak up carbon, and and so obviously you know we need we need to really be increasing our tree cover, um, yeah, exactly. and so yeah, and so I, I feel like that that is a really good opportunity if there if there are going to be any, any opportunities in terms of tree planting I think there's a lot of people who will be up for that and um, definitely kind of mm. getting involved and helping to plant some trees and things I think you know if there's going to be any kind of volunteer days in terms of sort of mm. planting some trees and things I'm sure that would be really interesting and we can kind yeah. of get the, the details sent around um, Transition Chester Chesterfield um, newsletter and stuff as well so that'd be really good if any uh, opportunities you've got coming up. That'd be really great. Yeah definitely that'd be great. Do you, yeah, so. do you know when the next uh, day is going to be for volunteering? We, um, we're sort of uh, keeping it to our current volunteers at the moment, but we are um, mm. taking uh, details from people from okay. when we are able to offer it out to the public again. Okay, uh, so but... should I just, how would you, when will I get to know and put my name forward to support sure. you? Yeah, so if um if Greg passes on um our details of how yeah. to touch okay. and uh, That's then yeah. you can email us and uh and yeah, Nick. you'll be first yeah. on our waiting list for sure. Brilliant. And do you do work with the canal as well, besides the river? We have done uh in the past. Um we were planning on doing uh well we do a lot of our training at the um the Hollingwood hubs there. Uh, mm -hmm. and um, we were going to be involved with like an, I think it was a nature festival that was going mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. you know, we're friends with the trust and they, they but they've just got it sorted for like, uh, yeah. for, the, yeah. for, for the litter and volunteers. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. uh, they, they've mm -hmm. got it covered. Uh, but you know, it works. Oh. It, yeah. The river yeah. and the canal are yeah. really alongside yeah. each other. So mm -hmm. it's two cross paths. Every hand sort. in hand, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm, thanks, okay. thanks for that, Angela. That's great. Um, yeah, and like I said, we'll send we'll send the details around of how you can sign up. Okay, guys, that's lovely. Well, well. I'm I'm going to have to go now. Um, no worries. Well, thank, thanks for joining. Um, no, and I, I I will see you very soon, yeah. guys. Thank thanks, you for arranging this coaching. Take care. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Take care. You're welcome. Um, so. Um, yeah, I just wanted to raise a point about um, like this is a, this is something that I've kind of been thinking about, especially I think sort of I watched um, we watched a film called The Story of Plastic and in, um, in May, and ever since that um, I watched that um, I've kind of been thinking about this issue around um, turning off the tap about plastic um, pollution because obviously like. Um, yeah, like you know, there's, there's there's this thing about that litter cleanups and li litter picks and river cleanups and things isn't the isn't the kind of the, the sort of be all and end all solution, is it, to sort of to tackling plastic pollution? And you know, we we have to do something about kind of addressing this issue this issue at the source. And the the film, the story of plastic, talks about how we need to really turn off the tap, uh, you know, for plastic packaging and plastic pollution you know sort of all the you know all the big plastic manufacturing that takes place all over the world um you know because we saw in in any kind of um another sort of countries like indonesia and malaysia sort of you know the the litter sort of you know arrives every day on in on their shores and it's just it just keeps on coming and coming every time you know so you're cleaning up the rivers and stuff all the time and it's not making any difference and so this is why we need to kind of push back in terms of looking at addressing the plastic issue at the source, looking at plastic manufacturing and really putting the pressure on. And what um, what we kind of do to try and do around that is we're working with the um, Break Free from Plastic Co um, Coalition, um, which is an international coalition. And what they do is they do something called brand audits. Mm -hmm. And it's basically groups all over the, the, the world. Um, and they they kind of, they carry out these river cleans, the litter picks, the et cetera. Um, and what they do is they kind of collect data from all of the, you know, the litter picks and the cleans and things and the beach cleans and things that they do. And then basically um, it, you tot it all up. So you kind of collect all the data and look at kind of what, what, what packaging are you finding? You know, who are the manufacturers? Who are the brands? What are the supermarkets? You know, that you're kind of coming across in terms of sort of the plastic packaging that you're finding. And you, you know, you kind of add up all that data and, you know, you just think how much data you can, can you get from all over the world? Um, yeah, so, so what happens is we, we kind of, we can 
we can compile all that data and we can kind of look at it and we can then look at targeting the issue. Um, so we want to really start, um, you know, and that's going to be a, a big, big thing really. And this autumn, there's going to be a big plastic protest all over the, the UK to try and put the pressure on these big manufacturers to do something about it. So I, I don't know what you think about that in terms of sort of like, you know, looking at, you know, sort of, I don't know whether that's something that you do in terms of sort of looking at, you know, that what you collect um, from those cleans and things and, look, you know, kind of compiling that data really to sort of identify sort of what, what, who are the main polluters, that kind of thing. Uh, it'd be very interesting to get a, a view of like the average volunteer to what type of plastic we're getting. It would be really interesting to find out, yeah. Is that something that you think you might be able to do then in the future where you could look at, um, you know, looking at kind of looking at some of the, the data that, that you're kind of getting from the, from the cleans that you, that you, you do? Yeah, yeah. If um, if we were you know involved with the project uh, like you mentioned, um, yeah, it'd be it'd be you know just like another string to our project of uh, of why it's important and yeah, you know we like to add to the to the uh, volumes of data as you've seen with our citizen science project. So it could just be another citizen science project almost. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, so I think um, we, are, we will be working with lots of other um, groups all over the Chesterfield to kind of do the same. We'll be, we'll be organising a number of litter picks and cleans, um, you know, all the different friends of groups. Um, and like, you know, I know I've spoken to Rod from the Canal Trust, you know, we're going to look at kind of organising, um, yeah, all, all sorts of sort of like, you know, litter, litter picks and river cleans and things. And so there's going to be a big, a big focus this autumn in terms of sort of, you know, looking at kind of some of the data that's coming coming back from some of the, the, the you know, the cleans and things that take place this autumn. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anyone else, yeah. Um, Shirley, do you want to? Uh, just going to say, have you got the dates yet for the plastic protest days? Or is it still out there? I think, um, well, I've, I've only just sent an email to all the Friends of groups in Chesterfield. Um, well, to kind of... I'm, I'm Secretary of Friends of the Inkman. Oh, great. Oh, good. Clearly landlocked. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, so it'd be great if you can kind of get involved in that and, you know, to help organise a, a kind of clean up and things. Um, well, we, do so... clean, we do do two clean ups in the park, uh, one in September after the school holidays and you know, one at Easter and things like that, ready for spring. So, yeah, well, you've got my email address. So, yeah, that'd be great. And sadly, I've got to go now. So, Matt, brilliant presentation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, thank you. Greg, excellent sorting it out. Good night. No worries. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Great. No, that's brilliant. Excellent. Uh, did anyone else have any other questions for um, before we f finish up? Because um, uh, I, th I think that was uh, there was an issue raised. Uh, Hillary raised an issue earlier about sewage. Um, I don't know if we want to, anyone. I don't know if you wanted to sort of. Um, talk any more about that um because this, this, this is certainly an issue about sewage um at the minute isn't there hillary yes yes can you hear me yeah yes it was it's just such a big issue now with obviously with the flooding be, because it's totally unregulated and these huge amounts of sewage that are offloaded into the rivers and into the into the seas and I, I also was a bit concerned about, you know, the people doing the cleanups in, you know, in, in the rivers and so on and so forth, that they've got adequate protection because apparently, you know, it is a carrier of C-19 and, you know, the world has changed a bit. But also the water companies self-regulate their judge and jury, which is absolutely hopeless. So I was wondering what influence we could have, if any, on how, how to address this or you know, because obviously organisations have more clout than individuals. So I was just wondering what, what your views and, and, you know, Matt's views were on this. And anybody's indeed. Mm -hmm. Well, um, our, um, sort of, we're part of an umbrella of Rivers Trust and uh, Rivers Trust headquarters have got a campaign about, um, you know, making um, rivers safe enough to swim in. And I don't know whether you've seen that 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 campaign, but it does talk about um, you know improving um, 
sewage um, treatment works and not having them, uh, you know, dumping lots of waste into the river. And uh, so, yeah, they're sort of like the main proponent of that, uh, pro that, um, that sort of protest, I guess. Um, but yeah, well, we I, was, get... I was also going to say, Matt, um, Surfers Against Sewage have got a petition at the minute as well about, about this issue. Yes, um, everybody sign it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So obviously, it's you know, this is it's a, it's a huge issue at the minute, um, especially. And um, I think I think I was particularly concerned that there was I saw an article about the the the, the, um, the head of the Environment Agency looking at kind of weakening river pollution um, regulations and things. And so it's it's kind of it's a, it feels like a, a bit of a concern in terms of protection for, for rivers going forwards. Yeah, totally. Um... But um, yeah, us as a trust don't really get involved with the, those sort of campaigns. Um, we just don't have the resources available, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, um, Rivers Trust HQ are really good at uh, those sort of campaigns. And they do have the resources. <laughs> yeah, definitely. May I just make one other oh, comment? Oh yeah, no, definitely, yeah. Something that happened, I, this appalling issue of wet wipes. Um, when it says they're biodegradable, they are not flushable down the loo. They, 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 they will biodegrade in however many years in landfill, but absolutely no wet wipes are flushable down the loo. And that's another issue that, that, that you know, people don't understand because it's out of sight, out of mind. And, and I mean, that it is appalling the extent mm. of pollution in the oceans and the rivers and everything from this, these very things that actually it seems to be that the thinking isn't joined up on it, that, you know, that the message is not clear because obviously companies, you know, mass produce them and, and want them, people to buy them. So they say that they're biodegradable or compostable and people think they can put them down the loo and actually it blocks, you know, waste installations, it blocks everything. Of course it does, it makes fat balls, it does everything. So that, you know, that's another issue that, that's a, a sort of a wider concern, obviously, but you have to deal with it every day because you're, you're cleaning up the rivers and that's really unfair. Yeah, yeah, we see it. It's, it's awful to see it after the river's been um, in spirit, after, after high waters and just seeing like all of the riverbank with the brambles being littered with, um, yeah, sanitary products and wet wipes. Um, and it's in, almost impossible. It's like cotton wool, uh, like strewn across the, the, the sort of plants. It's very difficult to get out. So yeah, we, I think, I think, it's, a, I think it's also <laughs> yeah. It also, it also feels a concern about like you know with all the COVID stuff. Like you know people have been buying a lot more wet wipes and things yeah. and stuff like that, haven't they? And I think yeah. you know that that is going to be. I'd be interested to know sort of whether like any of your you know your, your kind of river cleans kind of going forwards. Sort of be, you know, whether you're going to be starting to see more wet, like wet wipes and things as a result of COVID or whatever, you know, people flushing them or, you know, that, you know, disposing yeah. of things. So, yeah. yeah, maybe there's, who knows, yeah, what, if we're going to find more, but um, there's quite a lot of campaigns around about not, like, I know that Yorkshire Water has a big one about not flushing them. And, um, you know, we do, we do our bit of trying to tell people about flushing wet wipes because we get. After a volunteer, they would get very frustrated and angry and uh, just want to, you know, like tell people what, what is going on. But uh, yeah, it's slow progress. And frustrating. You do a great job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you do. <laughs> and our volunteers do as well. Yeah, it's, they, they're, they're the ones that are really committed. Thank you very much. I have to go now. Thank yeah, no, that's great. Thank no, that's brilliant. Thanks, thanks for that. It's really useful. Thank you. Um, but yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for joining. Um, but yeah, I think I think we we're kind of coming to a close. I think, but I, I don't know if anyone else had any questions. Um, but um, you know, I just yeah, um, yeah. I just I just I think it would be really really good um, to yeah, just um, keep keep up the great great work. And obviously, we're going to have the you know we're going to have more river cleanups you know going forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, into the autumn, Definitely. and it'd be great to um, yeah, it'd be really great if uh, if you guys kind of got involved in this, 
this project um, for the you know for the um, plastic protest to kind of get involved in in uh, helping us to collect some data on that that'd be really that'd be really great so mm -hmm. look forward to working with you again and over the you know and in the future really so there's going to be some good opportunities and hopefully yeah there's going to be some good opportunities for next year especially as well in terms of going forwards so but yeah thanks thanks so much for for joining us matt yeah. and yeah. For everything and yeah, it's been really good to, to have you here and thanks for the presentation. No so. problem. It's my pleasure.